and he was like, what are you screaming for? Don't nobody want you? With a body like that, you ain't good for nothing but sex with the lights off. I went home that night and threw up everything I ate. And from that night forward for years, I was ballooning. Well, after I had my youngest son, I was nearly 300 pounds by then. And Shut what you say. The message I heard was, as a black woman, you are not enough mm. without a booty. I found out who the Kardashian's surgeon was, right? And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get me a booty. How does that weave into what we're talking about right now? And I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay. Because... This is The Deep End with LaCroix. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're taking a dive off The Deep End. Now, today, I'm excited for y'all. Because, first of all, this woman can do a million different things, a million, literally, write books, lead people, work in technology, and then if you give her, like, four words, she'll turn it into a whole sermon. I've seen it happen with my own two eyes. Listen, there's a whole bunch of other things I could say. I'm not even going to mention them all right now because I don't want to embarrass her, but you know, you know her, and if you don't, you under a rock somewhere. And it's not a big deal. It's fine. You know what I'm saying? Nona Jones is in the building. Yeah. How are we doing? Oh, I'm so excited to be here. There's so many other things I could, I was like, I was going to bite my tongue. But a part of, <laughs> one thing I was going to say was she can run six <laughs> miles in the time it takes me to run one. But you you did it at least once. I've been running lately because, okay. like, I never ran until you told me to run. Yeah, I, and I tracked you the first time you did it in the app. I tracked oh my you, gosh. and I was so proud of you, and I think that was the last time I saw you in the app. Yeah, I, I didn't use the app anymore. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you didn't want to be tracked. I was like, like, the accountability was was disturbing <laughs> to me. I just didn't need accountability, okay? Okay, okay. But I've been running. I'm, I, I, I max out about five miles. That's awesome, though. But that's, but that's where I'm at. You know so saying? we're making our way to a half marathon. We're we are our not, way. but you are. <laughs> That's fine. Good for you. I you have probably faith run. In you. you got marathons under your belt? No, I stick with the halves because everybody that I know that has done full marathons, they're like broke down. So they got oh, joint issues, nah, we don't want back that. issues. Yeah, we don't want that. I think the half marathon is like the sweet spot yeah. for me. Yeah, because you you look like you're in your twenties, but you're over thirty. I am so. indeed. I just turned forty two. Praise the See, I'm Lord. saying, yes. look at this. What I'm saying. So it's like we don't forties <laughs> is you don't want them it, kind of it's problems. It's different. Nah, man. You I need to I need to problems. walk for the rest of my life. That's my hope. I hear yeah. you. <laughs> you know, a lot of people know you for a lot of different reasons, mm -hmm. right? They've encountered you either speaking somewhere mm -hmm. or, you know. Um, on the interwebs, <laughs> being yes. extremely transparent about mm -hmm. some story that you've told. Mm -hmm. You're friends with so many different prominent figures mm -hmm. in the mainstream and in Christianity. I'm just like, but who who is Nona? Like who who where you from? Who your mama <laughs> name is? Who your parents <laughs> is? You know what I mean? Like who yes. oh, where where tell us a little bit about your upbringing sure. and where you come from. Sure. So it's funny because when people ask me to tell them about myself, like I don't ever think of anything I've done. I don't think about my resume, who I know. The words I use to describe myself yeah. are I'm a statistically improbable product of God's grace. Okay. Truly. Okay. Um, and to, to explain, so I was born to a mom who didn't want to have children. Mm. She and my dad had been married for about 13 years when she found out she was pregnant with me. And... Um, I think it was about halfway through the pregnancy, my dad started to have some stomach pain. So he went to the doctor to get it diagnosed. And they diagnosed him with terminal stomach cancer. Mm -hmm. And he was 34 at the time. Um, he lived until about two months shy of my second birthday when he passed away. And my mom, you know, she didn't want to have kids, so she was angry. Mm -hmm. She was just angry at the whole situation, that she was pregnant. She was angry that he was dying. And so after he died, she met a guy that she fell in love with, and he promised that he would take care of her and me. Mm -hmm. But he had to move us across the country, basically. So I was born up north. Um, he moved us down to Florida, and that relationship fell apart shortly after we got there. Mm -hmm. And so I remember from a young age, just like this string of men coming in and out of her life and my life. And she finally met a guy who became her living boyfriend. And from the very beginning, I mm. was about maybe five. I didn't like him. Mm -hmm. I just didn't like him. Like there was something about him that scared me. And I told her 
And she was like, you know, give him a chance. He's a good guy. He'll grow on you. Um, so he moves in. And I think it was about me six, eight months into him moving in, her sister passed away. And so she had to go back up north to the funeral. And um, I begged her. Like, I remember standing on the side of the bed. I begged her to take me with her to this funeral because I didn't want to stay with him. Like, mm. that was the big thing. But she couldn't afford another plane ticket. And so she left me with him. And um, the very first night that she was gone, he assaulted me. Mm -hmm. And I was, again, about five years old. And I remember him saying after it was over, you better not tell your mom because she'll get rid of you. She doesn't want you. Mm. And I didn't say anything because, again, I, I heard what he said. I believed what he said. And so when she came back, I was just a different kid. Mm. Like before that, I was super outgoing. I'm an only child. So I would be like super outgoing, talking all the time. I became very quiet, very reserved. Mm. Um, when I started elementary school, my teachers said that I was disruptive. Like if you look at all my progress reports, they all say Nona's disruptive. Nona talks too much. Nona is making all these issues in class. And um, I remember getting in trouble a lot in elementary school, but that was because of what was happening to me at home. Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward a couple of years, um, I was about seven and I just couldn't take it anymore because he was repeatedly abusing me. And so I finally told my mom what was happening and she had him arrested and he went off to jail. I thought it was over, mm -hmm. but on the day of his release from jail, she took me with her to go to the jail to pick him up and brought him back home. Oof. And I remember being in the back seat of the car when he got in the car. And of course I was absolutely devastated that he was coming back. But I remember he like looked, the way he looked at me was like a smirk on his face. Like he just knew. He How old knew. are you at this time? I was about seven and a half. I was about eight. Okay. But he just knew like, yeah, I, I can do whatever I want. And he did. Mm. And I'd never said anything again. And so um, being an only child, being in that situation, it was very, very difficult. And it was it was painful in multiple ways because my mom started to become physically abusive to me and verbally abusive to me. And so at the age of nine, I tried to end my life. Mm. And my youngest son is 11. And I look at him. I remember when he turned nine, looking at him and thinking, I tried to end my life at, at nine. Like, Man. It's, it's incomprehensible to me, but I can understand it because I've been there. Like yeah. when you literally don't know what's on the other side of death, but you're like, it has to be better than this. That didn't work. Thank God. Um, didn't grow up in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. Didn't know anything about the Bible, heaven, hell, Jesus, nothing. But at 11 years old, I tried to end my life again. And shortly after that, a classmate in the sixth grade invited me to church. And I thought we were going to go over her house play church. I just thought it was a game. I didn't know. Um, but her mom came and got me and we went to this church thing. And I remember pulling in the parking lot and like families were getting out of the car. And I saw like fathers holding like their daughter's hands. And we walk into this church and there was this tall black woman. I will never forget her face. She looked at me with so much love mm. and like, Hey, sweetheart, I'm so glad you're here. What's your name? And it was like the first time that someone actually saw me, mm. you know, mm -hmm. because at school I was getting in trouble at home. I was being abused. It was like this woman saw me and like welcomed me into this space. Mm -hmm. And the first sermon I ever heard the pastor preached out of, I think it was like Psalm 68 that says, God is a father to the fatherless. And I remember hearing that and thinking God is a God to the fatherless. I don't have my father. Mm. Who is God? Mm. And that moment literally changed the entire wow. trajectory of my life. Wow. Um, because I knew then, I was like, I need to figure out who God is. Yeah. Despite what was happening at home, despite the fact that we weren't a church-going family, that encounter, that moment, yeah. it's like it sparked something within me that started to, to place me on the path that I'm on today. So, you know, long way of saying, again... I'm a statistically improbable product of God's grace. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, the, some of what you shared, you know, I can relate to a lot. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've experienced similar abuse, um, had a tumultuous upbringing with my mom and mm -hmm. the men in her life. Mm -hmm. um, and it created insecurities and oh, yeah. probably a desire to, you know, uh, achieve and be something mm -hmm. in different kind of ways. How did that flesh itself out for you, like high school years? That is literally mm -hmm. 
my story. Okay. Um, I, and we'll get into it in a little bit, but like I know now that the rejection I experienced from my mother, that very just foundational relationship where mm -hmm. you should be accepted, you should be protected, you should be loved. The fact that that was missing, mm. um, it created a void. Yeah. created a void in my heart that I tried to fill with success, achievements, mm. awards. I remember, um, so, you know, in the church, uh, started to go to like youth Bible studies and I'm learning more about God, make Jesus Lord of my life. And at that moment, my mind started to change about what was possible for me because mm -hmm. I thought before then, there's nothing good about me. I'll never be anything. But I started to learn about being fearfully and wonderfully made, being mm -hmm. a child of promise. And so I was like, okay, I, I am somebody, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of paraphrase Jesse Jacks, like I am somebody. Yeah. And so I get into middle school and it was almost like this flip switched where I was like, all right, I got to be the best. I got to be the best. I got to be on top. Um, I remember I would be in student organizations. I couldn't just be a member. I had to be the president. President. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you were that girl. Listen, I was that girl. <laughs> like I, when it came to my grades, I had to get like all A's. I had to get the award. I had to get mm. the recognition because those things became a proxy for worth. I did not know it yeah. then, of course. Yeah. I just thought I need the applause. Yeah. Like I, I remember people smiling at me when I walked across the stage to get the award. I remember um, the compliments I would get when I achieved. And so mm. that's what it unlocked is like, I need to achieve to matter. Yeah. I didn't have the language for it then, but definitely now. And yeah. that's how I ended up. I ended up going to college on a full scholarship because I was president of like every organization in high school, student government, um, all these leadership programs, making all these great grades, go to college, repeat the same thing, mm. right? Then come out into corporate America, succeed there. And it's like, you get all the accolades, yeah. but there's not fulfillment on the other side of it. And that's what I experienced. So what about socially? Because I think for me, social acceptance became another big component for me. Mm -hmm. I'm just, how did that flesh itself out for you? You're in college, let's say college years. Like what is so, like, what does that mean for you socially? Oh, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So, um, I definitely would say probably middle and high school, I got into the popular crowd mm -hmm. because I was like the funny girl. I was the girl that could like get along with anybody and everybody. And I do believe that so rejection manifests itself in some different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are some people who um, they implode. Yeah. And that's addictions. That's all types of just like self-harm. Mm -hmm. Others explode. Mm. And now exploding could be in one of two ways. It could be um, I explode out of anger. Like I'm the angry one. I'm always acting out. Or I can explode into ambition. Mm. And so I became the popular girl. Everybody liked me. Everybody wanted to hang out with me. Um, I was the one that could make people laugh. I was like on the dance team playing tennis. Like I was hanging out with everybody. There was not a social group that I did not hang out with. Mm. So you had the kids from the projects. I was cool with them. The kids at the country club, cool with them. Yep. My teachers loved me. Like I was kind of a shapeshifter in some ways, yeah. which has served me well later in life. But mm -hmm. socially, I definitely needed to be accepted mm. by people. And so I think about college, man, that was a season of my life that if I could have a do-over. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say oh, that? Oh, because I so so I ended up going to college. And this I I'm I'm being super vulnerable at this point. Come on. Um went went to college. Um I actually had a boyfriend um going into college and he was a great guy. Mm -hmm. Love God. He was going to be an attorney, I was going to be a doctor. And I went into college. I think I was a little chunky at that time, right? Okay. But I ended up losing weight my first year of college from all the walking. And suddenly guys started to notice me, right? Mm. Now, here's the thing. I was always like popular, got along with everybody, but I was not the girl that guys wanted. Okay. So then I get into college, I lose weight. Suddenly guys uh -oh. are like, okay, okay. Then I pledged, I become president of my sorority. Then it was like, okay. And uh. so I broke up with my very stable, very kind, integral yep. boyfriend because I wanted to be wanted. Yeah. I got to, I got to. I got to, you know, be in that place where yeah. acceptance is. It, it became like literally it was the drug of choice for yeah. me. You know, I didn't do actual drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't do any of that. Mm. But it was being wanted. Mm. That that idea that, okay, yes, 
guys want me. And so I got into some relationships that, again, if I had a do-over button, whoo, I would do that thing over. Yeah. But I now know that I was driven into that because there was a deep, deep, deep need within me mm. that I had not, I didn't have language for, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, and so I was literally willing to accept the lowest bidder. Yeah. Because I just wanted to, to be, be wanted. wanted. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's kind of like you you put yourself in a position to not get what was best for you, but what that that addiction was craving. Ooh, yeah. And and that's yeah. the way you were functioning. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm curious because I know some of your story, but mm -hmm. some people who don't know some of your story, um, you know, you talk about this. You were chunky. You lost a little bit of weight. Yeah. Like this journey with weight, and and even as we, you know, there's a lot of people out there, right? You wrote this incredible book called The Gift of Rejection, which we're going to talk about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which we're yeah. going to talk about. But you can write a book like this because you've experienced it in yeah. so many different kinds of ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine there's probably a lot of women out there who, you know, their physical, mm -hmm. you know. The way they look yeah. becomes a, a part of their journey mm -hmm. of, of being accepted or rejected. For somebody who wants to be accepted yeah. and wanted, what did that journey of weight even mean? What's the significance of that for you? Yeah, so I developed an unhealthy relationship with food as a child because— okay. um, you know, my mom was working all the time, and, of course, the house was very chaotic. There was a lot of just— a lot of bad happening to me, but we always had food. So we mm. always had, and it wasn't healthy food either. It would be right. like, we had like chocolate chip cookies and Oreos and juices and all this stuff. And so what I would do is to kind of numb the pain of what I was feeling and experiencing. Mm -hmm. I would just eat, mm -hmm. I would just eat and I would eat and I would eat and I would eat. Um, because when I was eating, it was like I could actually experience some joy, yeah. right? I could experience. The dopamine of Yeah, that's food. exactly what it was. It was yeah. the dopamine of the food. And so um, I was I was always overweight, mm. and I was the overweight kid in elementary school, got called Miss Piggy, et cetera. Um, middle school, I was still overweight, but I was very active. So mm. I was like captain of the dance team. I was the biggest girl out there, but I was the captain. Yeah. Um, in high school, I was still overweight, but I was very active. Mm. Ran track, played tennis, did all these things. And I will never forget this one time. I was at a football game with a group of friends, and we were sitting in the stands. And I think it was like my 10th grade year. And it was very full in the stands. And so, like, nobody could really move in and out because there was a lot of people well, one of my friends saw a guy friend of hers walking um, at the bottom, like around the track area. And she was like, oh, come sit with us. Well, he was with a couple of his friends. And so they come up, you know, the bleachers and they're like trying to get down the, the row and they kind of made it past people, but it was tight. Mm. When they got to me, because I was so large, um, her friend kind of stumbled. And mind you, when I saw him, I was like, oh, he's cute because he was a very good looking guy. He stumbled over me and his friends started to laugh at him. They were like, ah, ha, ha. they were making fun of him. And when he stumbled over me, I remember kind of screaming like, ah, you know, and he looked at me and he was like, what are you screaming for? Don't nobody want you with a body like that. You ain't good for nothing but sex with the lights off. And he said it as loud as possible. So everyone is cracking up, right? Um, God. that night I went home and I remember saying, I think it was maybe Maury Povich or something, but there was a talk show about eating disorders. And I remember this girl talking about how she would eat a lot of food and she would purge, right? And I went home that night and threw up everything I ate. Mm. And from that night forward for years, I was bulimic mm. for years. You know me from music. You know me from concerts, you know me for shows. A lot of times I don't get the opportunity to express what's really going on in here and in here in the deepest, most articulate way possible. It's hard to do all that in a four minute song. So what I've done is I have committed to talking to you all on my podcast, The Deep End. It's going to be myself along with some other amazing friends some people that you would not expect to be there, but we want to have real conversations. We want to talk. We want to enjoy each other's presence. Here's the thing. 
People do not get vulnerable outside of community. So I want to have a community where people can feel safe and feel vulnerable. It's not for everybody, but it might be for you. So I hope to see you there. That experience was so deeply hurtful to me because here's the thing. Like I knew I was, I was large. Like I knew that, mm -hmm. but for, for him to put it so in my face mm. in such a hurtful way, mm -hmm. it's like something broke within mm. me. And I think there are many women struggling with eating disorders and men too, sure. quiet as it's kept. Sure. Because there was something that was said to them that broke them. Yeah. And like, I think about it, like, uh, I think it's Proverbs 18, 21 that says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Mm. That word that's translated power is actually the Hebrew word yad, which means hand. Mm. And so if you think about it, what, what that's saying is that the tongue is a hand mm. that shapes and, and creates. And, and the thing about a hand is a hand is a relatively neutral tool, right? Like yeah. hands build houses, mm -hmm. but hands also pull triggers. Mm. And if we're not careful, the hand of our tongue that should bring life and yeah. should encourage and should build up, it can destroy. And I think many people are suffering from eating disorders because the hand of someone's tongue mm -hmm. destroyed them. And yeah. that's what happened to me. And so for me, I, I literally carried that eating disorder into college, um, had an unhealthy relationship with food for a long, long, long time. But it wasn't until after I had my youngest son, I was about 30, <clears throat> I was nearly 300 pounds by then. And Shut what you said. Yeah. 300. Nearly 300 pounds. And wow. I found it hard to walk. Now, it's a lot of people going to struggle. First of all, pause, time yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as we look at you now, a lot of people can't imagine that. So, one, be motivated, be inspired. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. Two, like you can speak to a community that a lot of people wouldn't be able to speak to. Oh, yeah. Because this is a, this is a reality for mm -hmm. you. So, I, I don't mean to stop you. No, but I'm you're just, good. Yeah. But I did, listen, I... It's funny because um, a couple of years ago I was out, I think I was at Starbucks and I was like eating a brownie or something. And this woman walked by me and she was like, must be nice to be skinny and you can still eat a brownie. And I said, ma'am, I don't have a skinny cell, <laughs> mitochondria, <laughs> Golgi body or, or electron <laughs> in my body. Like there is nothing about me that is skinny. Um, but I, I tried... Slim Fast, Jenny Craig. I tried Weight Watchers. Mm. Um, I tried the apple cider vinegar diet, Atkins. I tried just not eating. Mm. And it's like nothing worked. But when my son, my youngest son was born, and I was, again, close to 300 pounds, I remember laying in bed one day. He was crying in his crib. And it was a short walk to mm -hmm. his room. And I got up to walk to his room. By the time I got to the doorway, I could hardly breathe. Like, I had to stop and catch my breath. I was only 30 years old. Yeah. And I looked at my beautiful baby and I said, I can't live like this. Mm. I literally cannot live like this anymore. And I made a decision in that moment. I will not live like this. And wow. I tell people who are on a weight loss journey, I'm like the difference between success and staying the way that you are yeah. is literally making a decision to change. Mm. It's, it's not wishing like, man, I just, I just wish I could lose weight. It's not even hoping. I hope I lose weight. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm making a decision that I'm going to. And that decision created a cascade of, of, of future decisions. Sure. Right? Sure. That led to where I am. Today. So before, I mean, you were smaller when, when you got married. I was around 200 when I got married. But that's yeah. not 300. But you're right. I was... Less. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yes, I'm just, I was at a small, I'm just yeah. wondering if, like, yeah, you know, as we talk about rejection, you you clearly got to a point where it was like someone accepts me, yeah, and is married to me, yeah, and then you you gained another hundred, yeah. almost hundred pounds, yeah. Did you feel rejected then? Did you feel mm. how did that play itself out? That's a good question. Um, when I got married, I definitely like relaxed because before then I was relatively vigilant, like, mm -hmm. cause I was still dealing with bulimia secretly. I was still dealing with that. Um, but I was being very conscious of what I ate, but see, my husband's an eater. Like okay. he likes to eat, he likes to go okay. out to eat. And so I would go out with him and like eat and eat and eat, 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 okay. eat. So I did, I gained almost a hundred pounds just okay. being married and chilling. Um, 
the good thing though about him is like, and he'll even say it today, which is what blows my mind, is like, he was like, I didn't see you gain the weight. He was like, I didn't realize it. He was like, you know, I I see now in pictures. Yeah. He was like, but I didn't realize it. And I'm like, that is love. Does he that see that love. you've lost it? He does. Okay, because I'm like, I need you to see right. this. <laughs> I'm gonna no, need you he, to see this. He definitely, okay. yeah, he sees the difference. Um, but that that to me was such a blessing is that when I got on my weight loss journey, it was not for my husband. Mm. It was not because he was like, man, if only you would lose weight, then you'd be attracted to me. Like that was never the issue. I literally made the decision for me. That's great. And so that's why even to, to this day, I work out by myself. I run by myself. Yeah. Um, I started off, I was like, I need to have a running buddy. So this girl I was working with was like, I want to run too. So the first day we go out to the track, I'm waiting. She never shows up. I call her. She's like, oh, something came up. I said, mm. okay, cool. Second day. She's not there. I call her. Oh, something came up. That moment I said, I'm doing this by myself. Mm. Now, this is the one thing I will say about my husband. Because he doesn't care about weight, he would be bringing like cupcakes and, <laughs> and sugary drinks and sodas home. And I said, I can't have that. Yeah. I cannot have that. He was like, but you're on the diet, not me. <laughs> so he was not helpful. He was not helpful at yeah. all. Um, but I will say that eating again that was like home base for me. Yeah. yeah so even yeah. in my marriage, like, yes, I'm married. I feel secure in my marriage. Like eating is how I dealt with stress mm. on the job. Yeah. Um, eating was what I returned to when I ever felt any emotional trigger at all. That makes sense. And so that's kind of why I ended up gaining the weight. So I'm, I'm just curious. And I mean, there's so many places to go, but I just, I, I got to just camp here for just a second sure. because there's so many things that I'm, I'm curious about mm -hmm. because for those of us who are wired to want acceptance, mm -hmm. to want to be wanted, mm -hmm. you know, they say you can remove a person from slavery in an instant, but it takes a lifetime to get the slavery Ooh, yes. out of the person. So yeah. you've met Jesus, you've gone on a weight loss journey, you have mm -hmm. been in the Bible and you're mm -hmm. growing, but then one day you shred all this weight. Mm -hmm. Cause when I first met you, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I would have thought you was a former model or something like that. <laughs> like I'm just saying, like, so I wouldn't have known. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when, when does that happen? And does that like college version of you come back out? Like, ah, oh, okay, I'm okay. Back. No. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, thank God that I have memory because okay. I learned my lesson. Like okay. we don't need to go down that path. They ain't letting down that path for you. The foolishness. <laughs> Um, so no, I didn't have, I didn't have <laughs> that struggle. Um, but it's still a mental challenge because mm. I think that what we know in our heads doesn't necessarily change what we believe in our hearts. Yeah. So I could literally look in the mirror and I, or I could step on a scale and I could see the change, Yeah. but because I don't believe what I see, there's mm. still that mental struggle, mm. right? There's still the sense that I got to, even now I'm battling. I'm okay. I, I got to take off another 10 pounds. Cause you know, as you get older, Listen, the Listen, body don't, it does don't not, do what it's it supposed to fair. do. It, it doesn't. Does not fight fair. And so I'll have people say, you don't need to lose no more weight. But I'm like, no, but I have to because there is still a, a part of me that remembers what used to be. Yeah. And so I still feel like there's a fight there sometimes. Yeah. Um, but that's where that's where my personal struggle okay. has been. But no, we ain't going back. No. Yeah. Mm -mm. I was I'm always curious about that because because yeah. for me. You know, and I'm and I'm I'm really just telling on myself when I'm asking you these questions. That's really <laughs> like all I'm it. doing. I like it. It's because I remember my freshman year in college, I was I was out now I have the opposite problem. I was rail thin. Like really? rail thin. Yes. And I remember standing looking over the edge with my uh tank top on, and this girl looked up and said, Poor baby, somebody oh, no. need to feed him. Oh, and no. kept on walking. So I was like relentless, like I'm in this gym, I'm gonna <laughs> eat and get big. And you know, to the degree where I think the same kind of internal battle, internal yeah. struggle of acceptance and rejection yeah. and all those particular things, it shows up in different areas. So it's like I may have killed it in one area, but that that thing <sighs> pops back up in another area. So I didn't yeah. know if the desire to be accepted mm -hmm. and not rejected yeah. was popping up in other areas of your life. Because if oh, yeah. I'm... I'm outside looking in. All I've ever known you as is a a, a high level 
executor, an mm-hmm. executive, a mm-hmm. thinker, a leader, mm-hmm. mom, wife, first lady, co-pastor, whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, mm-hmm. that's all I've ever known. So yeah. people could be looking at you saying, where can you ever not feel accepted? Where do Oof. you feel rejection at anywhere? Man, it's like, it's almost like whack-a-mole. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, so you get to the physical piece and you're just like, all right, fine. I'm going to be in shape. Like everything's cool. Boom. But because that hole is still there. And that's the thing is mm. like rejection creates this bottomless, this bottomless pit mm-hmm. where you can fill it with the physical affirmation. You can fill, you can fit it with, I know people who are extremely successful, famous, well-known who feel like failures mm. because of a very, um, foundational rejection experience they had. And that rejection experience is like a talk track that tells you no matter what you do, it's never enough. And yeah. so for me, yeah, I would worked out, lost the weight, kind of got to the place I wanted to be. But then it shows up in, in my career, mm. right? Where it's like, I have to be the best. I have to be on top. Like I, you know, okay, fine. I'm a director. I want to be a VP. Okay, you're a VP. Fine. I'm gonna get to the C-suite. You're in the C-suite. Oh, I need to be CEO. Oh, now you're CEO. You got to get to the board. Like it's just mm. what I what I believe is that success is not a period. It's a comma mm. because you get to new levels and you discover there are levels that you weren't even aware of. Oof. Right, man. And so there's if you don't if you don't find contentment, it's mm-hmm. just this continual rat race. And I'm sure you could speak to that because I know. <laughs> Listen. I know you understand. I get it. I do. <laughs> but I but but I didn't write the book on rejection. You did. <laughs> but I think I think you like just okay. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna swap this for a second. So one of the things that I think is true that people don't grasp mm-hmm. is we tend to think on the other side of success is fulfillment. That's right. Right? It's That's like right. if I just get this, then I'll be great. But you want some Grammys, right? Just yeah. a couple. Yeah, no, just just, just yeah. a couple, right? That doesn't mean the Grammys aren't happening next year. That's right. Right? That's right. And so no matter how many you amass, mm-hmm. they're still next year. Yep. Yep. And and people think if I can just get the thing, then it'll be great. Yeah. But they the said, next year comes. They said, um, they said the most contented person in the Olympics, right? The Olympics has passed. The most contented person is the bronze medal winner. Mm. And they, they said the gold is the most depressed. The silver is the angriest. <laughs> and the bronze is content. The, 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 the gold medal winner is like, oh, man, now what? Right, right, right. <laughs> I got to do this again next year. Like, what do, you yeah. know, this isn't everything I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Silver's like, I almost got right, it. Right, right, the fulfillment yeah. I was looking for. And Bronze's like, I didn't even know I was going to get I'm here. <laughs> you I'm know what I'm saying? I'm here. I just, I, I think that's that's kind of the experience that I've at least had. It's like mm. with every new level I've gotten to. But again, it gets back to rejection and yeah. the void that it creates. It's like, man, if you have experienced a rejection that has has made you think that you're not worthy, that you're not enough, you mm. weren't chosen, you weren't invited, you were humiliated, you were embarrassed, you were blamed. If you experience that, yeah. it literally doesn't matter what you accumulate around you. Yeah. There's still a deficit within you that has to be treated. Yeah. You know? I, I want to talk about some of the, because everyone can listen to you talk about all this stuff, just like mm-hmm. they can listen to me. And, and one of the things that you're really good at or intentional at, I mm-hmm. should say, is being transparent. Mm-hmm. It's being like you you will lay your wounds <laughs> out for people to see. And it's like, oh shoot, she said that? Mm-hmm. Like she did that. Mm-hmm. You've said a few things and you've put that out there yeah. that I, I think it's helpful for people to experience some of the the blows you've taken, yeah. the 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 decisions that you've made in your fight yeah. to be the woman that you are. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, what you're comfortable sharing or what you're comfortable talking about, but sure. you know, if I don't know if there's one that jumps to the top of your mind, I have a couple, but if there's one that jumps to the top of your mind, <laughs> feel free. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh a couple of things that you've brought up. I'm just gonna <laughs> feel free, you know, feel free. Uh you know, is that well, uh, there's a couple. There, there's, <laughs> I want to this is start with this one. Okay. I want to start okay. with this. And if you don't want to go there, we don't have to go hey, there. I'm here to go deep. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. But 
I want to know the mindset. And I'm not because listen, there's some people out there who've done this same thing, and I'm not here. I'm not here to cast judgment. Sure. But you had a conversation about getting a BBL. Yeah, for sure. What? What it? What was the impetus? Yeah. The thought process. Mm -hmm. How does that weave into what we're talking about right now? Listen, first of all, and I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay. Because for whatever reason, it's something that we don't like to discuss. It's like people like to get the procedure to act like they didn't, right? Okay. Well, um, so my dad had a flat chest, as men do, right? Okay. My mom had a voluptuous, you know, chest, but she had a flat booty. My dad had the booty, right? But he had the flat chest. <laughs> Yo, I I've got, never heard somebody say my dad had the booty. My dad had the booty, <laughs> but I ended up with my mom's booty and my dad's chest, mm. right? So just flat all the way around, Okay, flat all the way around. And so when we talk about this thing about rejection, I would get made fun of wow. constantly for having no booty. You know, I mean, I'm a black woman, like well, a black woman. Yeah. Has curves. I don't need you to agree like that, though. You see the way. No, I'm saying yes. No, no, no. I was saying yes. I can see why. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm the sorry. way the way you. Agreed. I got in trouble for nodding my head once other time in my life too. I just <laughs> no, be nodding. But it's true. Sometimes. It's okay. true. Like black women have curves. Well, um, yeah, I didn't. Okay. And so not only did I not have curves, let me put it this way: I had curves in the wrong places. Like I had curves in my belly, mm. and I always would say, I was like, if I could just like push my belly to the back. Ah. Then I would be good. But anyway, it didn't work. So here I go. I lose the weight. And I'm like, all right, I'm in shape, but I have no curves still. And so I found out who the Kardashian's surgeon was, right? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get me a booty. Now, mind you, I had been doing the squats. Bulgarian okay. split squats, the barbell squat. Like, I've been doing the squats. Yeah. Squat, 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 squat. Nothing. So they lying? The trainers are lying? I think you have to have something, something to work with. Oh. I had flesh and bone. I'm not listening to any of these trainers anymore. <laughs> I see y'all online. I had flesh and bone. Like, you okay. can't make flesh and bone. Anyway, so I was like, I'm going to go to California. I'm going to get this procedure. In the air, flying to L.A., I hear the Holy Spirit say, if I wanted you to have a booty, I would have given you a booty. I did not give you a booty to keep you humble. Ooh. Now, I hear the Holy Spirit say that, right? Clear as day. I should have parachuted out of the plane, right? <laughs> I should have saved my money. And when I tell you I could have bought a car, okay, I'm not exaggerating. So with the money that it was gonna cost to get a booty. Listen. You could have got a Bentley I for listened. the price of a booty. It may not have been a Bentley, but right. it could have at least been a really nice Honda Accord or something. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So here I am, I hear the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, you know what, Lord? I'm gonna be humble with a booty. So I get to the, the I get Yo, to, this is crazy. I get to the doctor's <laughs> office. I get to the doctor's office and the doctor tells me, he says, listen, it's a fat transfer procedure. And so he said, I know you work out a lot. He said, you're going to have to not work out as much because it will basically burn the fat. And I'm I'm hearing him say this and I'm just like, yeah, whatever. I'm still going to work out because I'm not going to have a booty and be unhealthy. Right. Yeah. So get the procedure. Everything's great. I'm like, all right. We in there, right? So as soon as I can start working out again, no, I start time working out. out. Pause, pause, pause. No, we're not skipping over this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, Lord. You get the procedure. Yeah. Is it painful? I don't know. Cause I woke, I was, you know, I woke up and afterward. Is well, the healing process weird. painful? Like is it, it wasn't painful, but like you can't really sit on stuff. So, so like you just on a pillow. I had to have a pillow or yeah. a, a donut. Is that pretty much? Yeah. So I'm you, just sitting and like you fly home and it's, it's a mess. How do you fly home? You have to have a little donut. Pillow. So, and it's, you, like, yeah. does you get home and your husband has to, like, ice your booty for you? Is that how this did, works? I don't think he had to ice it. Okay. I think I just had to sit on the pillow and, like, keep, like, just sit on the pillow. Okay. So he didn't have to do anything. I'm just like, this is wild. It's, I just, it this is, is great. It is this is news wild. to me. I didn't know this. It is indeed wild. I'm learning. So I start I start running because I'm like, look, I, I the thing I'm not going to do, and this is what I had to do. I had to gain 10 pounds to get the procedure because he needed the uh. fat to work with, right? So I was like, I'm not going to get fat with a booty. So I start running. Within six months, my booty was gone. Really? Back to square one. So time out. You've you, had like four timeouts because in the story. I'm still. I'm, you. <laughs> this is no, no, no. This is old news to you. <laughs> You've been living with this whole story You're still processing. forever. <laughs> I'm. This is new news uh, to me. Okay. Yes, so yes, wait a yes, minute. Yes, yes. You get to go eat pizza and brownies. Yeah. Was that enjoyable? 
Not really, because okay. I knew what it was doing on my body. Okay, so like, you were like, but let me just go ahead yeah, and... Yeah, but let me do it, yeah. You gain the weight. Yeah. You get the booty. Yeah. You, you, you get the booty, you go back home. Yeah. You run. Yeah. And the Honda Accord you bought... Listen. It got stolen. Gone. It's gone? Without a trace. You can you can nothing you can do? No. I mean, what you what you what you go? You know, I don't and know. some people do some people do BBLs again, but I realized through I realized several things through that. First, I knew God said not to do that. Like he, I heard the Holy Spirit say, "No." Mm. I knew that. But the second thing I realized in that story, in that whole situation, I was like, insecurity is what led me I was to th- do it. I was going to ask you that. Like, what was the what message was. that you heard to tell you to get it in the first place? I the message I heard was as a black woman. You are not enough mm. without a booty. Sheesh. That that is the message I heard, and and it's because you know, listen, I worked in social media for many years, so I even know that what's posted is not the truth. But I fell for what was posted. Like you see all these women, all these curvaceous women, and I was like, man, I'm not that. Wow. Here I am, successful. Yeah. Here I am, healthy. Here I am. I literally have everything I want and more than I could have imagined. Yeah. But I still don't feel like I'm enough. It's interesting, though. I I always say this. If you live for their acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who is the they that was going to reject you for Mm -hmm. not having a booty? That's the thing. There wasn't... A person like look, my husband knew what he was dealing with, right? So it wasn't <laughs> like he was like, dang, if only you had it wasn't that. I believe that it was all those memories from years, from years. And that's the thing, it's like what what isn't dealt with doesn't go away. Mm. It's still there. And so here I am, literally at the top of my game, and I feel like yeah. I am not enough because I don't have this booty. It is just so married, yeah, kid. Yes. Enough money to buy a plane ticket and a new booty. Listen. <laughs> and not, and it's like something no. is still saying you're not enough. Right. That's when, so the revelation God gave me out of that, and I actually ended up writing a book called Killing Comparison about that experience because mm. comparison is what led me down that path. But the revelation God gave me is that we tend to think that insecurity is a function of lack, right? Mm. Like we think if I... If I lack self-esteem, I'll be insecure. If only I could just have more self-esteem, I'll be secure. But God said, insecurity is not a function of a lack of self-esteem. It's a derivative of your identity being secured to an insecure foundation. And if you think about what an insecure foundation is, that is anything that is subject to the approval or the opinions of people. Why? Because people's opinions change. Mm. One day... They, they love you. Oh, my gosh, we got to have you, right? Like, we got to have Nona. The next day, they're like, who? Nona, who? Mm. And God helped me to realize that as much as I had, I was insecure. Mm. Because I believed that my worthiness was contingent on the approval and the acceptance of people. Yeah. And so that's what led me to make that decision. So that's kind of like what you talk about in terms of you know, not being accepted, being rejected is Absolutely. a gift yeah. at times. Yes, so. because it helps you to, re- you can do everything that people ask you to do. Mm-hmm. You can change your personality. You can um, change how you show up in the world to try to win people's approval. You can do everything they ask you to do and they will still reject you. That's And boy. so the gift is, if you let it, rejection will anchor your identity. Mm. Because you realize, wait a minute, people's opinions shift like the current of the sea. Mm -hmm. I need to be who God created me to be Mm -hmm. because that's the only unchanging identity for which I should aspire. So that's the gift. It's like, oh, you didn't stop trying to please people. (laughs) You on the runway. I want you to keep taking off. Okay. You on the runway. Like you, the, the, the pain of it though, like. The pain of looking online and seeing what you're not, the pain of the voices saying you're not enough, mm-hmm. um, that that pain 
you you talk about it not being able to be soothed by yeah. what you hear in your head. Like, can you elaborate a little bit? Oh, yeah. 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 So um, going back to even the whole like BBL situation, right? Yeah. Like I thought that if I can just get some curves, yeah. if I can just be accepted by people, then I'll be secure. Um, even after having the procedure, that did not change the talk track that was in my head. Mm. And the talk track was, your mother didn't want you. Woof. Your mother chose your abuser over you. It doesn't matter what you do to your body. That doesn't change that fact. Mm. So I'm sitting here thinking, well, if I just make this one change, it'll fix everything. And it's like, no, because there is a fissure in the foundation of my identity that was created by rejection. Mm. And so it's not about what you know in your head. It really isn't. It's about what you believe in your heart. Do you believe that your mother's rejection of you is an indictment on your worthiness? Do you believe yeah. that because she chose her abuser over you that you're truly not worthy? Because as long as you believe that, I don't care if you have the net worth of Jeff Bezos. Yeah. I don't care if you have the body of Cardi B. I don't care <laughs> if everybody on earth knows your name. You will still be insecure. And so mm. that's that was the process I had to go through and, and understanding, wait, I got to deal with this rejection because it's not, there's not a, a modification I can make to my body that will fix that because it's internal. It's not external. You have definitely sat and done the work. Like, I, it's obvious. Like, the things you're saying, I didn't hear till maybe five years ago mm. in the therapist's office. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like I can I'm, – I'm hearing somebody who has put in the work, yeah. who has processed this information because it's like you're right on the money. You'll always be insecure. Yeah. It's not going to go anywhere. Like, yeah. there's not enough winning you can do. There's not mm. enough – like, there's – it's a never – it's a a feast – it's like eating at a buffet thinking yeah. that you'll never be hungry again. It's like, no, that's yeah. not that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um it, and I don't I I hope I'm not stealing your thunder if anything. I hope I'm just Please. like throwing something yeah. that your way, but I'm I'm curious your thoughts on this like because rejection is a big part of my life, because not being accepted is a big part of my life. You can always understand or tell kind of like what a person wrestles with by what the main message they're yes. driving home all the time. So I'm always driving home. If you live for their acceptance, you yes. die from their rejection. Yes. <laughs> I'm yes. always saying it because that's the struggle. It's the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's the struggle. Yeah. Um, and what's encouraged me over the years has been like kind of looking in the scriptures at people who typically would not have been accepted or yeah. who experienced some rejection um, and how God will still kind of highlight them. And I'm trying to process and Maybe you can get some light to it. I... I'm processing like that juxtaposition of, well, if I didn't experience that, would I be as successful? Ooh. And is the success Ooh. worth the rejection I experienced? Yeah. yeah. Like Man. if David wasn't the least, mm -hmm. would he have become the yeah. I, like what are yeah. your what are your So let me okay, so I got I got the word. Okay, I come gotta, on with I gotta, the word. Come on, no, no. What with I want to do real quick, because you know, everybody knows about the David and Goliath story, right? Like, yeah. you know, even you know, being in business, people like to use that metaphor to describe, you know, a business battle where, you know, yeah. we're the David, they're the Goliath. So the Bible says, um, in this is first Samuel chapter 17, mm. that um Jesse, who was David's father, basically sent David to the battlefield to take lunch to his brothers, right? Yeah. And, you know, David wasn't, he wasn't in the army. He wasn't in Israel's army, but he goes out to this battlefield and uh, he overhears Goliath taunting the Israelites, right? Mm. The Israelites are basically lined up to fight the Philistines. Mm. And he overhears Goliath saying, you know, come out here, you know, I'll, I'll teach you a lesson. And David basically was like, what is going on? And so the Bible says, he overhears Goliath basically being like, you know, hey, look, you send out your best warrior to fight me. And if he defeats me, we'll surrender. And if y'all, if we defeat y'all, you'll surrender. So David basically goes to Saul, right? Mm. Mind you, again, David was not in the army. He just happened to be there to take lunch to his brothers. He says to, he says to Saul in verse 32, 1 Samuel 17, he said, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. 
your servant will go and fight him. Now, imagine Saul, right? He sees David, this mm -hmm. young shepherd boy, scrawny. Mm -hmm. He looks at him and he's like, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, he was like, listen, what you don't know about me is that I've been keeping my father's sheep. Mm. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, I struck it, I rescued the sheep from its mouth. He said, when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. He said, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Listen to this part. David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, we all know what happens next, right? David gets the smooth stone, slingshot, Goliath out. Mm. But the part that's interesting is David said, it was the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, mm. right? So he's out in this field tending sheep. A lion mm -hmm. and bear comes, attacks it. He didn't say his brothers or father protected him. Wow. He said it was the Lord. Why does that matter? Because if you go back to 1 Samuel 16. Oh, she about, oh, you in the book. 1 Samuel 16. I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. If they don't see it, I see it. <laughs> I know, I see I know you doing. see it. So the prophet Samuel oh, wow. comes to Jesse because God told him that he had chosen one of his sons to be the next king. God did not tell Jesse which son. He just said, I've chosen one of, one of the sons. So Samuel tells Jesse, bring all of your sons to a sacrifice. Jesse brings seven of his sons. Wow. And after Samuel meets all the sons, he's like, none of these have been chosen. Are these all the sons you have? Jesse says, there is still the youngest. He's out in the field tending sheep. Goodness. And what's amazing is it isn't that Jesse didn't know where David was. It's that he didn't invite him. Dang. Right? So David is left out in this field to tend sheep. By himself. And Fighting I, bears and lions. By himself. And you think about it, when I read that, like that became the basis of the book because I read it and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that David had been left in a field by himself fighting off lions and bears with nobody but the Lord. Mm. But it just so happens that those were the necessary preconditions for him to stand and fight Goliath, mm. his rejection wasn't just a rejection. It was a training ground. That field became a training ground yeah. where David learned that he didn't need anybody but God. Mm. Not only that, see, Lecrae, this is the part that really blesses me. So Samuel said to Saul, he was like, excuse me, Samuel said to Jesse, because Jesse's like, oh, there's, you know, the youngest is in the field. Samuel said, send for him. Mm. We will not sit down until he arrives. Isn't it funny that Jesse brought all of his sons, left David in a field, but God still knew where David was. Wow. God knew where David was. Wow. They left him out there. They didn't acknowledge him being in the field. God knew where he was. And my message to people is basically the message of my own life. Mm. It doesn't matter who left you in a field. Mm. It doesn't matter who walked away, abandoned you, thought you weren't good enough, mm. said you'll never be anything. Mm -hmm. God knows where you are. Man, that's so good. That's so good. Like, I, I can think specifically of people who experience circumstances. I mean, honestly, that's most... In my industry anyway, right? Yeah. That's most of the successful people are people who are pushing back against what someone else told them they couldn't do. When you hear like yeah, like Michael Jordan's story, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. he got cut from the mm -hmm. team. And it's like, oh, I'm never getting cut again. And so it's like that's the, the training ground, like you said, yeah. for the success. I think the problem for a lot of us is that. We're still trying to prove to yes. someone who rejected yes. us that we're valuable. Yep. And yep. I, and 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 it's like, dang, you know, it's like, man, God gave us a gift in that rejection. Yeah. But a lot of us aren't accepting it fully to see like you're accepted now. Because we don't realize it's a gift. Because the mm -hmm. reason why it's painful, and this is how God really helped me to open my eyes. The reason why it's painful is because we're so focused on who walked away 
Mm. that we have forgotten who never left. Like we're so focused on who said we're not enough that we have forgotten who already said before I formed you in the womb, Mm. I called you. Mm, set you apart. That's so good. And so we don't see it as a gift. And that's why we keep trying to prove to people, oh, now now you'll accept me. Now, look, I achieved this thing. Now you'll accept me. It's like, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, the fact that you didn't choose me, there's a gift in that. Yeah. Lord, what can I learn from it? Yeah. I don't have anything to prove to anybody. Listen, my name has been placed in rooms that I don't even have access to. My name has been placed in rooms Mm. that people tried to deny me access to. Mm. God did it. Yeah. And so that's why when people, when they don't, you know, choose me or maybe they don't invite me or whatever, I don't get angry about it because I'm just like, look, I know who's in my corner. That's good. I still be feeling away. (laughs) (laughs) I still be low key feeling away. I'll be feeling away. That's that's, that's, that's real. I need to be honest. I'll be, but not like. I guess I'm not. I, that's so good. I love what you just said. I, if when I don't get invited to those rooms, I know who's in my corner, and I gotta go back to that. Cause yeah. sometimes, like I'll see people, and I know people think I'm just living the best life ever, but I'll see people, and I'll be like, man, I want to be there. Oh yeah. You know, like mm-hmm. I, I'm gonna just be honest. Yeah. Like I'll be seeing Kev on stage and Tabitha. Uh, you mm-hmm, know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They be on family vacations and stuff, and I'd be like, dang, don't nobody be inviting me to no stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to just remember who's in my quarter, man. You know what I'm saying? Cause I know y'all, but y'all don't invite me. I don't y'all know and invite me. me. Nobody, they think I'm already invited. Right, no, right, they don't right. invite me because they feel like I'm already invited. I had a situation. Listen, I was at a meeting in uh, Washington, DC a couple months ago. And I was at this meeting and there were some of my peers there, like peers in ministry. And they asked me, they're like, oh, are you leaving here and going to this other like exclusive invite only thing? I didn't know nothing about this thing. Right. And it was OK because I had to go preach somewhere. But I was just like, no, I, I, I don't know anything about it. And I started to feel some type of way. Right. Because yeah. I was like, why did they choose me? Why did they invite me? Like it started. But because I had been doing the work, mm. what I realized is I was like, I'm not supposed to be there. Oof. But here's the other thing I did. I reached out to the person who organized it and I said, hey, just so you know, if I was supposed to attend, I never received an invitation. And it's okay if I wasn't, but just so you know, it isn't that I didn't show up. I never received an invitation. And she said to me that she thought I had been invited. Her team was handling the invitation or whatever. Whether or not it's true, I don't know. But I was free. You're better than me. So free. (laughs) Cause see what I would have I would have assumed the motive. Uh, yes, yes. I would have been like, yes. oh, I, they don't they don't rock with me because of this. Right, right. This is right. why they don't rock with me. Right. So I guess that's why they didn't invite me. So yes. whatever. Man, and I then mean, still be in pain and angry. Yeah. And that's why it's like, I thank God. I've I've mm-hmm. matured in so many ways that it really doesn't hurt me anymore. That's so good. It really doesn't. So I'm curious because <clears throat> that I've done the work yeah. and I and I'm and I'm it's tongue in cheek when I say like I feel the <laughs> way. I know. I know. I mean, like I, I, I'm confident who God made me to be. Sometimes I may get a little, you know, yeah. I may rise up, but, yeah, right. <laughs> but, I, like the, the world that I exist in, mm-hmm. like for so many years, it's been a situation where, like I, I, I bring it up all the time because I'll never forget giving my mixed CD to an NBA player and he and him hearing it's gospel rap and he's like I don't want to hear no gospel rap mm-hmm. and me feeling like but it it's actually could be good right. you know so good. I felt rejected yeah and I think for a long time in my career I was like nervous about like am I being obnoxious I don't I'm, I don't want to not be associated with Jesus yeah but yeah. I have these wounds. Of my dad abandoning me. I have these wounds of being rejected in the past for so many yeah. things. And so if I lead out there, are they rejecting me or rejecting Jesus? Mm. And, I, and there's this confusing piece. And I'm curious for you, you've worked for corporate entities. Yeah. You've worked for major companies. Mm-hmm. And you've been able to integrate your faith in those kind of ways. Like, did you wrestle with being rejected for that, or how how's that played itself That's out for you? That's such a good question. Yeah. And I, I would say, I think for you, it's so much more poignant because yeah. there's such a, it's it's what you are producing, right? <laughs> like, I am producing music that glorifies God. So it's kind of 
obvious. I, um, I would say in my case, I in in the early years of my career, I definitely struggled with it because I wanted to be seen as a professional, right? Mm-hmm. Like I wanted to be seen as a businesswoman. Um, I did not want the baggage of, oh, there's the Bible thumper again, you know? So I <laughs> I didn't want that. Um, but I think as I grew in, more secure in my standing, mm. I realized that I didn't have to have an either or position. Okay. And I realized that I also didn't have to be in your face. I didn't have to walk yeah. in the office like, all right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jesus is God. I didn't have to do, I didn't have to do that. Yeah. I could just be I could be the gospel. Yeah, like yeah, I yeah. could literally, so and I good. had like colleagues who, you know, atheist, agnostic, Jewish, and they were going through things. I'm like, how can I pray for you? Mm. Something just as simple as that. Yeah. I didn't have to be like, you know, Jesus is the way. Yeah. I didn't have to do that, but I just had to be an example. That's good. And that's how I started to kind of earn the right that's good. to actually share the gospel with people. That's so beautiful, man. I, I'm <clears throat> like, even as you were saying that, um, And just talking about how, you know, you could be the gospel and like there's a lot of people out there I would imagine that are fearful of being rejected for their faith or where they stand and so on and so forth. And one of the things that's encouraged me is like, oh, yeah, Jesus was rejected. And you talk about that. But like, what would you like? How would you encourage somebody in that kind of way? I think you just have to know like rejection will happen. It will happen. Like there are people, it don't matter how good like your your music is amazing, and yeah. there's still gonna be people who are like, "No, nah, I'm straight, right?" <laughs> Stretch. So you just have to know like that's going to happen, but you also keep your eye on what is the purpose, what is the what is the mm. mission of what I'm doing. So, for example, when I was recording the audio book for the Gift of Rejection, the engineer like totally don't care nothing about God, Jesus, Bible, none of that. But I, you know, I'm recording and he's listening and he's mm. listening. And as I, before I even started recording, because I didn't know who all would be um, staffing the project, I prayed. I was mm. like, Lord, anyone who touches this, may they have an encounter with you in some way, in some small way. Yeah. And so after we finished recording everything, he came up to me and he was just like, look, I am not religious at all. He said, but I got to be honest. He was like, Hearing this book has changed the way I see quite a few things in my life. He was like, as a matter of fact, he's like, I got to have a conversation with my wife. (laughs) I don't know what they got into, but he was like, I got to have a conversation with my wife about some things. He was like, I haven't been to church in years. He was like, but even hearing how you just talked about God and Jesus, like it just took me back to a place that I haven't been to. Mm. Um, And for me, that was a blessing. And it was vicarious. It wasn't me saying, so, sir, what do you believe? It was just... (laughs) Me being me, and I think that's what we have to do. That's good. Um, in the same kind of realm of like, you know, owning this faith gem of yeah. rejection, yeah. as you call it. Yeah. Uh, like I think about the people who are single out there, right? Who mm-hmm. are just like, you know, I, I mean. I could bring up the men, but I don't know if the men wrestle with it as much as the women in 2024. Mm-hmm. Like, I just don't know if it's the same. I'm, you know, fellas, you you have to inform me because that's not what I've seen. Mm-hmm. I got way more single women who are like, do you have a good one? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> laying know, around. You know. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? And I'm like, dang, I, I'm running out of, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I don't know, man. You know what I'm saying? Um <laughs> Uh, so shout out Jonathan McReynolds because you're the last one left, brother. You better uh, man. Listen. We need to Facetime him for real. Like, what are we waiting on? Brother? He's the last what one left. What are we? The last man standing. Last man standing. But I'm, but I'm, I'm thinking about women who, you know, I know you've experienced some some yeah. bad apples. You've been cheated on. You've mm-hmm. experienced like, oh, yeah. and I'm sure that felt like somebody was saying you're not enough. Oh yeah. But like for for. I guess I would I'd be curious, like, what would you say to some of these single women out here yeah. who are like, it's, it's taken forever. Yeah. I'm not being embraced. I'm not being accepted. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm struggling with that. Is this a playground for my faith? What does this look like? Yeah. You've been I got cheated on. And mm-hmm. like, how would you address them with kind of this same impetus, this message? And so um, I'm going to tell you just what my headline is, and I'll tell you a story because okay. I think it's important. So the first thing is to recognize that people do what they do because of them, not because of you. Ooh. So this idea that, man, if only 
I change something, maybe then they'll, it's like, no, if look, the reality is if a man is not ready, mm. I don't care how amazing you are. Mm. He's not ready. That's good. Because it's for him to be ready. Um, so when I was in high school, I had a boyfriend who was just amazing. Like I thought he was awesome. And um, he was really, really smart, really successful. He wanted to go into politics. One summer, he went to do an internship with like a state senator. And um, when he came back, he wanted to take me out to the movies. And I was so excited. I got my hair done, my nails done, got a new outfit. But a couple of hours before we were supposed to go, he called me and was like, a family emergency came up. I can't go. And I was like, ah, but it was cool. I called a few of my friends and we went to the movies. Mm -hmm. So standing in line, I just happened to look over. And in the next line, I see him Shut your holding face. hands with another girl. And he looked like he saw me the moment I saw him and like the color drained from his face. He was like, I felt so as you can imagine, just so hurt. Like, it was like, not only did he, like, reject me by saying he wasn't going to take me to the movies, but he's been cheating on me, right? Fast forward, um, working at Facebook, then Facebook, um, pastor friend of mine reaches out, and he's like, hey, I need you to have somebody's page taken down. I had never been given that request in my life. Like, take someone's page down. Usually they want it to be take, brought back up. And I was like, what's going on? He was like, oh, man, there's this pastor. Um, people are saying horrible things on his page. I just need you to take it down because it's, it's not right. So I said, well, send me a link to the page. I'll see what I can do, but probably not anything. So he sends me a link to this page. The guy who I was seeing in high school, his picture is looking at me, right? I scroll down and I see all these comments from people talking about serves him right. Cheaters get what they deserve. Wow. This guy was shot and killed. Uh, by his mistress, who tried to kill his wife. When I saw the picture of his wife, it was the picture of the girl that he was with at the movie theater that night. Whoa. And in that moment, I realized I had, I had felt rejected because I thought that he was cheating on me with her. He might have been cheating on her with me. Mm. And I could have been on either side of that situation Wow! had it not been for the protection of God. Wow! And so I share that story because for women who are grappling with being single and it's like, man, I'm just not enough. I'm not chosen. I'm not this. Mm. It's like, let me tell you something. Mm. The protection of God is worth so much more than companionship. I'm about it, to leave. That's it enough. Really, I'm done. <laughs> We're done. This is enough. It's too much for my, I cannot. It. This is so good. It God. is worth so much more than companionship. I can't even imagine what my life would be. Like, his former wife has made a full physical recovery, but I can't imagine this, the psychological trauma. Then come to find out, he, he was with many women. Like, mm. many women. It just so happened that this one particular woman killed him. Goodness. But I think about that, and I'm just like... Lord, thank you. I thought that that's what I wanted. I thought that's what I needed. And God was like, you have no idea who you're dealing with. Well, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> no, sincerely, um, yeah. that is, I mean, there's such a wealth of wisdom that bleeds forth from you. Um, mm -hmm. And if anybody's watching and is like, man, they've really hit home with so many issues. I think it'll be deeper and more powerful in this book. <laughs> Which now I get why it's a gift. Yeah, man. Like, because it didn't make sense. It was a gift of rejection. Yeah. But I, I get it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I do. I, I have some some questions I want to ask you. I'm going to throw you underwater. Before I do that, I've just just to, just for those who. Anything else you want to say about the gift of rejection, like why you wrote it or what, anything well, else? There's, there's one, there's, so I want to tell a really quick story because Please. I think what's important for people to understand is one of the first gifts that we get from rejection, and it, it doesn't make sense in the moment, but the gift of rejection positions you for purpose. Mm. It really does. Mm. Um, I talked earlier about, you know, David and how he had been left out in that field by himself. That's right. And that actually became the training ground that prepared him to defeat Goliath. Um, 
unbeknownst to him, like when he was in the field, I'm sure he felt the pain of it, right? Yeah. Like being left out there. But um, some years ago, I worked for a large corporation. So I've been in corporate America for many years, but I was not hired as a spokesperson. At the time, I was not a speaker publicly. Like I would speak in church every now and then, but not not like professionally. And uh, the communications team came to me because they heard me speak at an internal event and they were like, have you ever thought about maybe doing conferences for the company, like speaking as a spokesperson for the company? And I was like, not really. I was like, but you know, I'm happy to do it if you need me to. So they sent me to some conferences just to speak for the company. And I guess I did a good job. And so they started to send me to do more and I was doing media for the company. Well, when performance review season came around, my manager gave me an exceeds expectations rating, but she was like, we're going to have to shut down all that speaking. I need you to focus on your core work. I feel like that's a distraction. Mm. I was so hurt by that because I loved what I was doing. Like I discovered a passion that I didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm. Right. So I went to the communications director and I was like, what's up with this? Like, what am, am I not doing a good job? And she was like, no, you're doing a great job. She said, the problem is your manager came to me and said, she wants to be the one speaking for the company. She's jealous of you. Wow. And I was like, what? So fast forward to make a long story short, I was like, okay, fine. I'm gonna focus on my core work. We're not doing the speaking anymore. But because I had gone out and done conferences, people were emailing me, inviting me to do more events, right? And so I said, I was like, look, I can't speak on behalf of the company anymore, but I'll send this to the communications team. And they were like, no, we want you. Can you just speak as you? Mm. Like, can you just speak as Nona Jones? And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I reached out to the communications team and I asked, can I just speak as Nona Jones? And they were like, well, yeah, if you don't use your title or the company name, that's fine. And I said, okay, here's the thing. When I was speaking for the company, I couldn't get paid. When I started to speak as Nona Jones Incorporated, suddenly I can get paid. Got BBL money. Listen, <laughs> show did. It got to the point that I was making as much in speaking fees as my corporate salary. Wow. And here's the thing. She closed that door. And I was so hurt, right? Like I was like, wow, she closed this door in my face. Mm. But what I didn't know is that her closing that door was God's redirection. Whew. If she had not closed that door, I would probably still be speaking for companies just internally. Like that would be my thing. I I had never imagined myself as a speaker, like wow. not outside of, you know, I'm like doing something at my church or something. I never thought I'd be traveling around the country of the world. Speak like what? That oh, was wow. never in the cards for me. And I just want to encourage people that in the hand of God, rejection positions you for purpose. Like it just positions you. Somebody reject me, please. <laughs> I need some rejection. <laughs> I need my rejection. But is it like everything, honestly, like your life, you've been positioned. There Man. have been rejections yes. that have literally positioned you where you That's are so today. Good. I, I don't know. I'm going to do the work now that you said that and start doing some homework and thinking through backwards. Yeah. I think all of us should do that because that's powerful yeah. when you think about it like that. Like, wow, God, you were really setting me up for something I didn't realize. Mm -mm. And that's crazy to think about. That's yeah. so encouraging. Yeah. Like, yeah. all right, I'm 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 in. There's a gift in it. I'm sold. There is. The pain is not a gift. Like, let's be honest. For sure. The pain is not the gift, but what... What rejection can teach you about yourself and others, that yeah. is the gift. That's so that's good. Well, you know what's funny is, that's actually funny because I wanted to be a part of, I won't mention the name, but a particular group of individuals doing music. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a part of them so bad. Three Six Mafia, right? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. The point is... <laughs> They rejected me. <laughs> and I was crushed yeah. by that yeah. whole scenario. But I wouldn't be here. Absolutely. I wouldn't be here. So I, I as I'm thinking through other things, I'm like, dang, Lord, what what you been doing behind yeah. the scenes that I haven't paid attention to? Yeah. And when's the next rejection coming? I don't want the pain. No. But I do want the playground, the faith gym, as you would call it. Because he works all things together for That's our good. That's so good, man. He just does. Yeah. So... You know, you you lose the way for you, mm -hmm. not for your husband's sake. But yeah. is there a sense of, you know, 
making sure that I am at least where he finds me physically attractive? Do you feel like that's a thing? Like, you know, being intimate and just all of those details, like, was that something that, what would you tell people now? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's important. I mean, to me, it's important. Like, I... I do want my husband to see me like as the most beautiful woman in any room. Right. You know, like I want him to feel like, man, I'm so honored to have her on my arm. Mm. You know, not only is she successful and smart and all that, but she makes me look better. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. And so that is important to me. And what's funny though is, I don't know if it's that important to my husband. And maybe that's because he's what he's used to now. Like my husband makes fun of me. He'll be like, Cause I just, I like to dress. So yeah. if I'm going to go run to the grocery store, I'm going to put some clothes on, get my hair together. And he'll be like, you don't have to wear a prom dress to Publix. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> but it's not a prom dress. You know what I'm saying? Because I just want to look good for him. And then of course, yeah, like when we doing the grown people things, you know, you want to yeah. look good. And yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. part of confidence. Okay. Now there are some people who they are fully confident. It don't matter what their body looks like. They're like, look, I'm alive. So I'm yeah. confident. Yeah. Me, because of my background, like my level of confidence really is connected to just how I look physically. Yeah. And so, yeah, I want I want him to be like, yeah, that's mine. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a mix of you and your husband. So I'm I'm both of y'all mm-hmm. to a degree. I'm like, I'm I want to be presentable and and look mm-hmm. the part, but at the same time, if she come to bed with a bonnet, I'm like, it's all good. It all works the same. I'm not tripping. <laughs> but my husband is that way. And I don't understand. Maybe it's just a woman thing. Maybe. Yeah. Cause like, I don't know. Like I want, like I go buy the things, you know, I like oh, to go yeah. pick up stuff and he'd be like, Oh, that's cute. Take it off. And I'm like, well, I, dang. I'm that, I'm me and I him. Even... We're the same guy. <laughs> We're the same guy. I'm not. Y'all are so uncomplicated. I'm just like, Hey, listen, I don't, you, that's cool. If you, that's right, what you, that's what you want to do. do. I don't listen. It's, I don't need it's that. fine. That's what you desire. But 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 out in public, yes, yes, yes. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. Yeah, I'm always like, bang. Let me. We gonna pick you out some shoes. <laughs> we gonna pick you out some shoes because you're not gonna dress your age out here. No, okay. You're not gonna dress your age. <laughs> you're not gonna dress your age. Okay, we gonna keep up with the time. You're not gonna be 22 dressing, right, right, but right, you're right. not. You no. we, you know people get into mom mode, dad mode, and they it just is quit. True. They it just is quit, true. and that's why I have to help my husband because he know like he's not a dresser. Oh yeah, like my yeah, husband. Yeah. So just a few years ago, we had to get rid of. He still had the like sweater shirt that he wore on our first date. No, because to him, no. that was like the epitome of style. No, I need. That's no. not why he had it. He had it because it was a memento. No, no, no you're huh? not right. No. You're wrong. Okay, I'm and telling I, you. I'm telling he, you. He felt <laughs> like you are a liar. And the of truth style. is not in you. And I said, babe, we Ooh. gotta, we gotta do better. If he got any sweaters with the zipper and the ring around it, the zipper. So here's part. the thing. No, <laughs> no. We literally just did a goodwill haul Man. because I said, honey. And like like the dad shirts and like the dad shorts and I said no oh, yeah. we got to get ourselves he, together. He, he's like listen that's why we married each other you know we good for each other we yes. help each other yes he has stepped his game up I'm proud yeah. of him because like I've put the pieces in his closet yeah. and now he can just put them together and he's been yeah. doing good that's how my wife is same thing but my wife we're a good balance because <laughs> without her I would probably be dressed like Bad Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It would be all bad. It would be bad. I'm yeah. just flash everywhere. <laughs> yes, yes, so yes. So we, yes, we level yes. each other out. Yes, that's it's dope. true. Same. I appreciate Same that. over here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sure. This is The Deep End with LaCroix.